Spiegel, practitioner Vance Gardner, who is one of, to my mind, one of the most grounded conscious practitioners that I know. So open your eyes, open your hearts, and put your hands together and join me in welcoming Vance to the podium. Good morning, everyone. I really have to get grounded after that introduction. <laughs> but I don't know if everyone can feel it, but I just feel a consciousness of love and openness and acceptance in the sanctuary this morning. Everyone can feel it? Yes. Yeah. I'm not convinced. <laughs> it's really lovely. And it's indeed a pleasure and a blessing to be here with you this morning to share some ideas. This month is a month of many celebrations. As we know, some people have celebrated their Earth Day, like practitioner Carol Charlton. And tomorrow is Memorial Day in the United States. And in this month, there are celebrations of families Mother's Day, celebration of the proletariat or the working class, and May is Child Month. So we can all celebrate because we are all children of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. We have a right to be here. So big up yourself this morning. <laughs> Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese American mystic in the prophet writes, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts for they have their own thoughts. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. I love that, the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Emmett Fox tells us that life is consciousness. And Amit Goswami, prominent quantum physicist and lecturer at the Holmes Institute, School of Consciousness Studies, which trains CSL ministers. In the book, The Self-Aware Universe, How Consciousness Creates, postulates that consciousness is the ground of all existence. Now in preparing for this sharing, I saw an article that showed that a lot of prominent scientists, like veteran physicists, at the New York City College of Technology, Gregory Matlov, are now proponents of what is called panpsychism, which have concluded that the universe is self-aware and that consciousness is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent in essence. Therefore, the universe is knowing itself and expressing itself in, true and as you, me, and every child, the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Isn't that awesome to know that just like the moon and the stars, you have a right to be here, and that the same power which created the moon and the stars out of itself is expressing as each and all of us at the same time all the time. So today, I want to share some ideas with you about that raising children is raising consciousness, and that when we raise our consciousness, we lift up our children. In his book, Raising Resilience, 
the wisdom and sense of happy families and thriving children, Dr. Christopher Willard offers a wealth of teachings det detailing 10 universal principles for happy families and thriving children, which are based upon spirituality and science. Like Les Crane, he declares that children live what they learn, and children learn what they live. Everyone knows that song? Children live. Uh, I'm not going to try and sing it. <laughs> but the part that I love is teach them the way to love in their hearts, and they will find love in the world. I'm not going to focus on all 10 principles today. I just pick out three of the principles that he gives us. And that the first one is doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. Yeah. And to live in harmony with oneself, one's family, and one's community. The second one is our truthfulness and honest behavior creates safety and freedom for all of us. And the third one is to cultivate loving kindness, compassion, and empathy. These three principles remind me of Matthew 18, verses 3 to 4, when Jesus, the master teacher, said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whosoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But what does the master teacher mean when he said that we should become like little children? From the non canonical gospel of Thomas, we are informed that Jesus saw some babies nursing, and he said to his disciples, these nursing babies are like those who enter the kingdom. They said to him, then shall we enter the kingdom as babies? Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make the male and female into a single one, so that the male will no longer be male and the female be female, when you make eyes in place of an eye, a hand in place of a hand, a foot in place of a foot, an image in place of an image, then you will enter the kingdom. What he was saying, that therefore we should trust the universe like our nursing babies trust their mothers. And that we should foster a consciousness of oneness and acceptance of all. Live from the inside out, authentically and uninhibitedly, expressing love, joy, light, and our inner gifts. And to be in the moment, enjoying life and the glories of our world. This is slightly different from the position that Jesus said in the rest of the passage in St. Matthew, where he was saying that if your hand offends you, you should cut it off, and so on and so forth. In this case, he's taking a more sense of mind-like position, is to replace the negative with the positive, to change the image into a more positive one, and to see from the inside out, not just with your physical eyes. What he's in fact saying is that all godness is right here, right now. There is no place where godness is not. As Erin McCabe of the Unity Village Chapel, that's one of our, our favorite affirmation, all godness, is right here, right now. Can we just affirm that? 
all godness is right here, right now. Many gurus and spiritual teachers believe that to attain this level of consciousness, which is called cosmic consciousness or enlightenment, one has to retreat from society into places like monasteries. But if that was the case, then basically I'd be wasting your time this morning. And Jesus would have given us some pie in the sky teaching. However, the founder of this teaching, Ernest Holmes, like myself, know that there are ways that we can live consciously and expand our consciousness in our everyday activities by applying some simple practices and always remembering that we live in a conscious universe which is always supporting us. So we don't have to be like what Oliver Weldon Holmes said to be so heavenly bound that we are of no earthly good. <laughs> right. So back to Willard principles for raising conscious kids. And you, the first one I say is to do the right thing. Because the right thing is always the right thing to do. And remember, children live what they learn. And if you live from a place of integrity, they will learn how to make good choices intuitively. Also, you'll feel better about yourself. So your neighbors and your friends will relate to you better. And kids can sense this vibration that people have towards you. You can also tell them stories, like about the lady who found the money in the ATM and returned it and how grateful people were to her because she did the right thing. Let them understand that she was not looking for any rewards. But when you do the right thing, more good things are attracted into your life. The second principle is to be truthful and honest. And that creates safety and freedom for everyone. And this follows from doing the right thing for its own sake. We encourage, we often encourage children to be truthful and honest, but some parents while doing that will get a phone call or a visit from someone they are avoiding, and they tell the child to inform the person that they are not home. And worse, when the child tells the person that mommy said that she's not home, <laughs> The parents get annoyed at the child, <laughs> right? Then what are you teaching the child? You are teaching the child hypocrisy, don't you? That's what you are teaching the child. And you're teaching the child that to be selective with their honesty, right? Because, as I said, the song said, if a child live with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child live with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. And if a child lives with, shames, with shame, he learns to feel guilty. So we have to be careful and mindful of the behavior that we model to our children. You know, we, might, we might not think that it's that important at the time. But you'll be surprised at how people can build up on any principle that they learn and take it way beyond where you may want to take it. Like I heard this joke about this man who went to the embassy. And he said he wanted to go to San Jose in the United States. So the embassy person tell him that the J is pronounced as a H in the United States. So the man taking the principle, when the person now asks him, when you, from what period do you intend to stay in the States? He said, from honorary to whom? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That is, you know, taking the principle. <laughs> and, and really, really up on it. So you have to be careful what you tell people 
uh, what a wise mother to them. The third principle that Willard gives us is to cultivate loving kindness, compassion, and empathy, which brings me to the key practice to raise our consciousness and cultivate these practices, which is mindfulness. And how do we cultivate mindfulness and facilitate it in children? That is by learning to go within and encouraging our children to do the same. Now meditation is the main tool we teach in the science of mind to go within. But for kids, we can start with practices like quiet time and time out. Margaret Brissett Holt, she's the principal at Holy Trinity, started doing transcendental meditation with first farmers and then all the other students in the school. And she said that it made a remarkable difference in a positive way in a change in their behavior. She said that it allowed the, ch the children to focus better, to relate better with each other at school. And she said that just by helping the children to be and become what they can, to fulfill the potential that they have, is what really brings out the greatest joy. Right? By learning to go in the silence and watching our thoughts is really an important practice. Because we know that in the silence, there is peace. And in the silence, we find ourselves. When we are quiet, still focused, or in the zone, we are mindful at the level of our receptivity to the unified field of pure potentiality, the self-aware universe, life longing for itself, as you and me and all of us. There are video games that develop mindfulness in kids. And when kids learn to play games, they have to be aware of what they are doing while learning to cooperate with other children as members of the same team. However, the greatest learning comes from living. And if a child lives with tolerance, the child learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, the child learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. And if a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. And if a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. And if a child lives with approval, he learns to be himself. And if a child lives with acceptance and friendship, he learns to find love in the world. If you live consciously and authentically, or as my Rastafarian brethren would say, heartically, from inside out, knowing who you are, that we are one and that there is no separation, from this enlightened consciousness, we cultivate loving kindness, compassion, and empathy. We may wander and go astray, although Jesus tells us that the yoke is easy and the burden is light, there are a lot of distractions in life, and it is easy to get carried away into captivity, so to speak. But just as in meditation, we can return to our mantra, our centering thought with the aid of the breath. So in life, affirmations and prayer, along with meditation, returns us to our center. So we can be gentle with ourselves, so that we can easily and effortlessly raise our consciousness and that of our children. Remember, what Confucius said in it is that our greatest glory is in never falling. 
our greatest glory is in rising each time we fall. The American Academy of Pediatrics said that when we teach kids the principles of meditation by spending quiet time with our kids, it helps to reduce their stress level. By helping them to take a break and by sharing meditation with children and teachers incorporating mindfulness training into their lesson plan, we are helping teach children how to stop, focus, and just breathe. And that is one of the greatest gifts that we can give to our, our kids. And that is from an article titled, Just Breathe, the Importance of Meditation Breaks for Kids. So there is an exercise in your program that will raise your conscious, consciousness if you practice it diligently, 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 <laughs> it will help you to attain enlightenment. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you can, I think it's, we're in the, pro page 10 in your program. We are not going to do the, the practice right now, right? But it's a good practice. This is, you know, Reverend John loved to give an assignment. So this is your assignment. To spend some time each day to do this practice. So that you will develop that consciousness of enlightenment. And you know, when I see how balanced and successful are the kids who grow up in this teaching, I believe they are a great testament, not only to their parents, but also to the community. As Easton Lee said, my mother is a people. And this kind of validates the blessing that we give them on Sunday morning. So temple parents, big up yourself. You know, and each of us can take a bow, cause we play a part, cause we bless them every Sunday. You know, and we see the Christ in them every Sunday. So we can big up ourselves in terms of blessing our children. So I'm just saying that by raising our consciousness, by being mindful around our kids, so that we don't make statements negative statements to kids that can have a lasting, sometimes even traumatic effect. Because I remember one time at school, when I was, when I was at KC, after hockey training, I was chasing this guy with a hockey stick. <laughs> and I ran straight into the vice principal. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> And without asking for any explanation, because myself and the other person, we know we were playing, right? He said to me, I'm going to read about you in the star. And I said, well, what this man is saying we read about me in the star, <laughs> you know? But only to find out that I did make the star, but not in the way that he was thinking about it, <laughs> in that um, we had a all-Island chess tournament that year. And our team, as a schoolboy team, was the first time a schoolboy team won the All-Island tournament. Not, a, not among schools, you know, but among all the chess clubs in, the, in the, the thing there. So sometimes we have to be careful of what we declare to our children. Declare things that are positive, that are uplifting. Be conscious. Raise your consciousness. Namaste.